over their response to the mass protests in Cuba. Thousands of people there chanting freedom and down with communism while marching in the streets. But the Biden administration is blaming the unrest on COVID cases and deaths. The president finally getting around to reacting to the situation. The United States stands firmly with the people of Cuba as they assert their universal rights. And we call on the government, the government of Cuba, to refrain from violence and their attempts to silence the voice of the people of Cuba. And it's been crickets from self-described socialists like Bernie Sanders and AOC. They're quick to bash America, but so far have yet to condemn the communist regime. And take a look at how White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki carefully avoids saying the word communism. There's every indication that yesterday's protests were uh, spontaneous expressions of people who are exhausted with the Cuban government's economic mismanagement and repression. And those, these are protests inspired by the harsh reality of everyday life in Cuba, not people uh, in another country. Economic mismanagement, <laughs> a.k.a. communism. So Dana Perino, it's funny now, you don't say communism, the liberals say authoritarianism. And it's funny because that was the exact same word they used to describe Trump. President Trump, <laughs> who was the polar opposite of a communist. Yep, and I think, I do feel like the White House got to a better place today than they were yesterday, and a lot, with some stronger statements, including from the president and the press secretary. While the protests had just started, they had, I think, like the deputy secretary of Western Hemisphere, like they're the only ones that said something, and Jake Sullivan said something from the White House, from National Security Advisor. Not good enough. But I do think that this White House learned a little bit about supporting dissidents and freedom movements after what happened with um, Iran and the Green Movement, and we didn't do anything during the Obama administration, and they took a lot of heat for that, and they actually never, I don't think they ever really got over that. So I, th I think that they, they finally got there. But what's also interesting is that the, the initial response is that, oh, this is COVID. It's because of vaccines. <laughs> Everything's because of COVID. COVID. And now that, there could be some of that, but I also think it's very interesting that I didn't know about um, some of this pop culture stuff that's going on down there. It's often artists that will push forward. And there's a rapper named, I got to read it, Michael Osorbo. And he's quoted as saying, people are tired and they can't take it anymore. And a lot of his work has been really pushing people to think about their conditions. And part of the spontaneity is that there's young people there who want a better life. And the other thing I think that you see the White House weighing in a little bit more strongly today than they did yesterday is that Democrats see Florida slipping away as yeah. an option. Permanently. Yeah. So, Greg, I thought socialism was great. The health care system was terrific in Cuba. Why would they be upset with the COVID situation there then? I don't know. They got a hell of an education system, too. That, too. But it is, I will say this. It probably is better than ours at this point. <laughs> um, I, you know, the thing is, uh, it, I think right now this is one example of showing how foreign policy doesn't really matter right now and not just for our white house but for our media and for our culture in general when you think about what's going on right now right so you got this stuff going on in cuba you we just had an assassination in haiti mm -hmm. you got china making aggressive moves in in you know all over the place you got russia and ransomware which is basically cyber warfare and now we have this cuba stuff but our press is doing all their trench reporting in in the culture war we are now so obsessed about our past and litigating our past that we're not looking around and we're not looking at our future and what could happen next. These are the battles that are currently being fought, but we believe that the battle is over non-binary toilets, right? And pronouns. And I, I sound like I'm getting, but we are spending an inordinate amount of inordinate, inordinate, this is important. Inordinate. Thank you, important. <laughs> uh, um, amount of time um, reckoning with our past as opposed to understanding what, I mean, imagine, you know, if you think about pre-World War II, if we were obsessing over the things we were obsessing in America, what would have happened? You know, would we have ever uh, would have engaged the, the, the Germans or the Japanese or anything? It would have... We would have been, you know what, we're not able to do that right now because, you know, Billy doesn't feel uh, like Well, we never down? would have dropped the A-bomb on the Japanese, and that probably would have cost millions more American lives. So what is with this just knee-jerk reaction, everything's COVID, Jessica? They see anything in the world, COVID, oh, COVID, sorry, <laughs> COVID. I mean, is that all we have? Once, sooner or later, COVID's going to be gone. What are they going to blame next? Never going to be gone. Never going to be. It's going to be a variant. <laughs> it's going to be the Cuban variant. Yes.
Mm, that's tasty. Well, you are correct about that. We're never going to get rid of COVID. We have to learn to live with it, which we have mostly by this point, which is a very good thing. But Jen Psaki also, managed, uh, also mentioned economic mismanagement. I know you would prefer that she, you know, was screaming socialism or communism. Why would she say communism, do you think? I I'm pretty sure she would, and I'm pretty sure that she has said it. But I think that... The argument that the White House is trying to make, and I really agree with Dana, that today seemed near perfect. I obviously haven't been a press secretary myself, but the statement that the Biden White House put out this morning, Tony Blinken also commented on this to make sure that everyone knew, because the Cuban government is saying that the U.S. is fomenting this, that we have no role whatsoever um, in causing this uprising, and it's their people that are upset uh, with how the regime works. I think we've been forceful. We've been allies to them. We're saying we support you in your you know, your cause, your desire for freedom, to live free of an authoritarian. And author authoritarians come in many packages. They come in communist packages and they come in Putin-like packages now. They come in packages like an Assad. And so I don't really see a problem with calling them that. The problem is, is that it's neglected to talk about the why. Uh, you cannot talk about the people in the street and not talk about the Cuban Americans that are here. When I was on the campaign trail, I spent a lot of time in Florida, and it was very clear that the Latino vote was shifting because of the socialism mess. And it's one thing to read about these stories in history books, but if you sit down with those Cuban Americans that are in the United States right now, and they tell you the broken promises, there was, they believed it, and it, it, it broke them. And they came to America as a result. And so I think what, what was told Deaf is that the president and the press secretary didn't really speak to that audience and say, we hear you, we hear the people that are on the street, and we know the cause of that. That's why the word matters. Yeah. And it was a missed opportunity. Don't, was that a banned phrase, missed opportunity, Greg? I, Am I allowed to say that? I think you are allowed to say it, but you're only allowed one, one time. Okay. If you say it twice, then you're asked to leave the show. Oh, I'm asked to leave the show. <laughs> yes, you are, because it would have been a missed opportunity. Okay, thank you, Greg. <laughs> from the defund the police movement. The president focusing on guns and giving COVID money to cops while meeting with big city leaders and law enforcement officials. This comes after another weekend of bloodshed. Four people were reportedly killed in New York City, and at least 40 were shot and 11 died in Chicago. New York City mayoral candidate Eric Adams saying the focus of the meeting was on root causes of crime. This president is making it clear he's going to redefine the ecosystem of public safety. Why did it take so long before we heard the gunshots that families were listening and hearing every night? Other communities are waking up to alarm clocks. Communities of black, brown, and poor people are waking up to gunshots. And this president said, this is not the America we're going to live in. So if you were paying attention last week, and we know you were, um, Jessica, it felt like there was about to be a pivot in politics because the polling was starting to come in. The White House was starting to realize that people like Eric Adams are going to win over the progressives. Their, their ploy to pin defund the police on Republicans had fallen totally flat and actually hurt them in the long run. So now all of a sudden you see this pivot. Do, tell me about the Democrats positioning right now and is what President Biden did today an attempt to try to prevent some major bloodshed in the midterms. I think it's an attempt to prevent some major bloodshed in the literal sense and midterms bloodshed. I think that this is something that has mattered to Joe Biden over decades, and he made the wrong decision, certainly on things like the crime bill. Um, but it has always been a passion point for him to be in criminal justice reform and to talk about it. And I would say it goes back, you know, two, three weeks is actually when the polling started dripping in to say this is a problem, which is when we had the press conference on gun control and what's going on in our cities. Um, I thought. It was a good day for the White House on this, for sure. I think Eric Adams is certainly, you know, taking advantage of the new bully pul pulpit that he will get in November. I mean, we're going to elect a Democrat here. And I liked the show of, you know, that we had, there was a female police chief standing there with him who also spoke, that there are people um, from both sides of the aisle that are like, great, let's start, let's get down to business and addressing okay, well, this. All right, and so we'll see if they do something on that. Just as speaking of um, Eric Adams, this is what he said, Lawrence, um, on CNN this weekend about guns and where the priorities should be. I believe uh, those priorities, uh, they really were uh, misplaced. And it's almost uh, insulting what we have witnessed over the last uh, few years. Uh, many of our presidents, uh, they saw these numbers. They knew that the inner cities, particularly where black, brown, and poor people lived, uh, they, know, they knew they were dealing with this uh, real crisis. We should have also focused on the handgun. The numbers of those who are killed by handguns are astronomical. 
All right, so uh, you have his comments and his appearance at the White House today and perhaps a new approach at um, the administration. Hmm. Maybe. I thought it was a disappointment. Uh, I expected more from him. He's talked about a lot of the root causes. I don't disagree with him on the root causes, but what are you going to do right now? Second of all, this is a local matter. This is not a federal issue. The attempt to federalize this issue is a problem. He knows what to do. It's very simple. And I call it just a simple justice plan. You bring the DAs in, you bring the beat cops in, the police chief, uh, you bring, bring in the chief judge, you assign a judge to these cases, and you give them a week. You tell the gangs, just like they want them to turn in the guns, you got a week to clean up your actions. And then you start busting down doors. You get warrants. You make sure it's solid. You have one judge that is assigned to these cases to look at the evidence, present it. They know who the gangs are. The problem is you have a DAs that are allowing uh, people with these weapons charges back on the street. You got judges that are assigning bail uh, when people are a risk to society. So everybody needs to get on the same page right here. You can talk about root causes all day, but that doesn't solve the problem right now. Now, that can prevent it in the future, but how do you stop the bleeding right now? Bring everybody to the table. Greg, one of the things they're doing um, at the White House is urging local officials to use COVID relief funds no. in order to pay for more police. So that's like an end run so that they don't have to actually deal with the fact that defund the police hurt them. Yes. Exactly. That they're, they're like, here's, here's some COVID relief money. And it does. It goes back to this initial problem. Why were they so late on this? And it's a lateness that caused, I don't know how many lives. You could probably count them. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, thousands. I don't, I, I don't know if you add them all up. Um, maybe if the guns were made of Legos, the Democrats would have gone after them sooner because uh, we're watching a government that's more interested in chasing phantoms than felons. And it's probably because it wasn't going to affect them politically. Why did they wait so long? Yeah. Because it wasn't going to affect them politically. And now we, on the, I don't know, for seven, eight months, a year, were saying this is a bad thing. And we were laughed at. We were laughed at by people on other networks like Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo. Going, oh, the shooting in the street. Oh, I went out to a restaurant. I didn't see any crime. Idiots. Because they, the reason why they couldn't admit there was a crime problem is because then they have to admit that they were wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge, huge sunk cost when you spend so much time saying that this doesn't happen. They put so much investment in an anti-cop narrative that they can't now admit that it was wrong. But there is a reason why they do this, and it happens in every political situation. They only choose the situation based on what Republicans do. So if Republicans come out as pro-law enforcement, they instinctively come out as anti-law enforcement. So if you talk about, as a Republican, talk about freedom in Cuba, then they talk about freedom as a phrase being anti-government. So you see what's happening here. It's a really stupid professional wrestling type of, a type of, uh, of, of debate, but they, they can't let go. And that's what's happening right now. You're seeing them try to let go. We should actually encourage them, but it still pisses me off that they didn't do this sooner. I'll give you the floor. Well, when I hear root causes from Democrats, that just means they're just going to run out the clock. Joe Biden can't actually even articulate what the issue is, and it is... Black teenagers and 20 year olds, many without uh, a good education, a dad or a job, they are shooting people with pistols, other gang members over turf and clout and drug profits. Stray bullets are killing, killing innocent people and Democrat DAs, prosecutors and judges are making it impossible to incarcerate these people as you mentioned. I get it, I'm a realist. There's gonna be street violence in the inner city, but we don't have to be so permissive about it. Every time we're so permissive about crime, crime explodes and people die. Joe Biden used to get this. That was his thing. And now because of the left wing animates his base so much, he has to now walk this tightrope. He knows the solution. He won't address the problem. Trump, love him or hate him, he would actually say what the problem was in really stark terms. People loved him for that. They also hated him for that. <laughs> but that's what real leaders do. Joe Biden's not a real leader, especially here's, on crime. Here's the problem real quickly, because I know we got to go. It's not just gun violence that's the problem. It's crime in general. The people that feel like they can just go into stores and rob, right. and just urinate on the street. It's, it, it's the fact that there should be no laws, that the fact that everything is petty crime. Criminal justice reform advocates have said drug crimes. We've said people that are nonviolent offenders should we, we should be measured in the way that we deal with them they believe no one should be locked up and the only reason why they're shifting on the issue is because the polling has changed
Looks but like there I were can... people, like the Chicago superintendent was there. I mean, you never meet a police yeah, chief. Yeah, he's been said... silenced by his mayor. He was a great police chief in Dallas. He was very enforced, had a relationship with the community and the police. And now he goes to Chicago and the, and the mayor has put a muzzle on him. I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't issues with how it trickles down from higher levels of law enforcement, but you were staring at a bunch of Democrats who are taking crime very seriously. And we were just talking in the break about, you know, we'll see who Eric Adams puts in as the police chief. That will tell a lot of the story of how this is going to go. But I just can't sit here and say, you know, Democrats don't care about crime. I That's think a big piece of case. this also is the prosecutors. And President Kamala Harris insulting half of the country by claiming voter ID laws won't work in rural America because apparently people who live there aren't smart enough. I don't think that we should underestimate what that could mean. Because in some people's mind, that means, well, you're going to have to um, Xerox or, or, or photocopy your ID to send it in to prove you are who you are. Well, there are a whole lot of people, especially people who live in rural communities, who don't. There's no... Kinkos, there's no Office Max near them. <laughs> Just to let her know, there's no uh, Kinkos in the at rural all. areas because there's no Kinkos at all. <laughs> they were bought out by Federal Express in 2000, something like that, and then they had their signs taken down in 2006. Score one for the Gutfeld. <laughs> anyway, L Lawrence, I look at this as progress. Uh, before, when they were making the voter ID arguments, they were just insulting black people, yeah. right? It was just only black now people. It's white people. Now it's white people. <laughs> we're all stupid, according to the Democrats. That's Be progress. Be before, before I address that point, can we just talk about Kamala Harris for a second? She is not good off the cuff. I love her. It, it is a, why do they continue to send her to do interviews? I don't know. Um, it, it, it's a bad strategy for yes. the White House. She's become a liability mm -hmm. for, for the message because it, she's not prepared right. ever. Even for the questions of the border, she's never prepared for the... But, but it's, I'm, I'm glad you point out the point that she's now insulting all people. Now, yeah, yeah. Right? I, I think they realize that they lost, especially with the black businesses owners. They're pissed off right now mm -hmm. that what, what happened in Atlanta. The fact that their businesses won't be... And, 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 the, and the fact that they went to Colorado. Yeah. And, and their laws are worse. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was a slap in the face. And so just take her off. Just, just take her off the, the trail. No more interviews. I don't think she's prepared. Yeah, you know what? I've said this before, Jessica, in her defense. She reminds me of me when I don't want to do something. I just do the worst job possible. <laughs> like on Fox and Friends? Yes, like if I always <laughs> use the Fox and Friends. I, I was terrible hosting Fox and Friends. They never asked me again. It's a strategy. And I think she's doing a great job. I find her arresting. If, uh, ironically. <laughs> That's a tough backhanded <laughs> one to go with. I, I was just going to lead with. Yeah. It, I wouldn't obviously have not had a discussion about voter ID that revolved around Xerox machines and the proximity to getting. <laughs> so you to agree one. it was bad. <laughs> I have not encountered a single person of any political denomination who defended it. Okay. Now, the larger discussion about voter ID that I think we're all excited to have as adults at the table, because I know that you love uh, it when I uh, say, we can Talk we all be adults? Yeah, it's <laughs> in your ivory tower. You know, I live in a right rural there, community. I, what's an adult in Soho? like? <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's the problem. So 11% of Americans don't have valid government photo ID. Jim Clyburn is now endorsing that. that. Well, take it up with the Brennan Center. I, that's fine. I will you, take it up with the yes. Brennan Center. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Clyburn, who I think, you know, really has his finger on the pulse of where we should be going to win elections and kind of, I, he ordained Joe Biden. The gravy from there is backing Manchin's plan, which requires photo ID, but it can be something like a utility bill. Right. And I think that if Republicans are bill. desperate, or a phone bill, anything that you get at your home, because there are issues with people matching birth certificates um, to their social security cards, et cetera, especially for elderly voters and black and Latino communities. So let's talk about getting somewhere with that so we can get the John Lewis for the People Act. So if it's free IDs for everyone, does that remove the issue about voter ID? If everyone gets an ID? I, I think I, I don't okay, want to let's, do let's do it. Yeah, I, I think the thing is, I think the challenge uh, that the Democrats have is they can never actually find somebody that they could show as an example. Here's Tom Stevens. He doesn't have an idea. They always talk about this group, but it's not there. And it's because, Jesse, well, yeah. they know that the uh, it doesn't 
IDs don't make it hard to vote. It makes it hard to cheat. Right. And they're trying to make it sound like, oh, this is making it hard to vote. Then show me one person. Just right. show me so one. According to the Brennan Center, <laughs> there are 40, Brennan, 40 million Americans that can't prove who they are. Yes. There's 40 million of you guys out there. Wow. We're going to have to really dig like into that babies? one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that one, They're Jessica. all in a NICU somewhere. I don't know about yeah. that no, one. They're, I, I don't know about that one. <laughs> also, I love what the Texas governor said. He goes, we want to make it easier to vote, harder to cheat. How could you disagree with that? <laughs> Easier to vote, harder to cheat. Did you say that? Two seconds ago. Right, well, you plagiarized Abby right? because he said it on the weekend. So all you want to do to make it harder to cheat is what? Signature requirements, deadlines, understanding the chain of custody, transparency in the count rooms. All you want to know is what's going on and who you are as you say you are. None of that conflicts with making it harder to vote. None of that. Yeah. So when I see Kamala Harris, you know how she gets that little shoulder thing going? <laughs> I love she it. goes, it's a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a point? What is, the, what is, like, the thing she does with her head? That's not a deep it's point. It's kind of like this. Right. It's, is that her signature move? <laughs> yes. So it's almost like, if you're going to lie to me, make it convincing. So here's the lie. Like, she actually cares about obstacles to voting in rural America. She doesn't care if someone in Wyoming has to drive 40 minutes to a Kinko's. She cares if someone in Atlanta or Philly or Detroit has to wait five more minutes. I'd almost appreciate it if she said, I want to make it easier to vote for everybody. I don't care if there's fraud. I don't care. There's going to be fraud. That's fine. I just want to make it easier. All we want are guardrails. And, and why is that so difficult? No one has been able to answer that question yet. Dana, uh, to Jesse's point, like the, the Democrat Party is always about the party of big government and solutions. Like we can solve the pandemic. We can go door to door. We can deal with you know, systematic, systemic racism. We have all these big solutions. But then voter ID is like, oh, my God, we don't know what to do. do Why don't we just get them free? Why can't you guys just send out IDs? Well, I feel like voter ID is this huge hurdle for Democrats over and over again. But the polling amongst black Americans and low-income communities is yep. that they like voter ID. Yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons that Congressman Clyburn is like, I can be for that. Like, yeah. Because you know what? Everyone's going to be for that, so you got to do it. Uh, Kamala Harris's team has been back-channeling for a while that they are frustrated with the assignments she's been given because they're hard. Mm -hmm. But she asked for this assignment. Yeah. And you know, in, in Georgia, one of the things that they did, remember that law, the terrible law? Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a copy of your ID. You just have to, you just have to write the ID number right. on the thing so that they can match it. That's the requirement. That doesn't seem like too hard to do, and I think pretty much everyone can get a pen. Not if, you're, if there's no Even Kinkos, there's no Kinko. where do you get the pen? In South Carolina, when you get the Nikki pen? Haley was governor, they did voter ID, there was a big uproar. She said, fine, we'll pay for anybody, we will come and pick mm -hmm. you up, we will take you to the place, and we will take you home. Mm -hmm. She had, I think, something like 30 people yeah. in the whole state, and then that issue went away, so it can go away. The last thing I would say is, Texas Democrats today have all left the state in a huff because they are protesting this voter bill that the, the Texas legislature is putting it's through. A huff and, and guess what? They're coming. What? They're coming to D.C. Ugh. Why? Because D.C. has the solutions. Mm. Rather than staying in their state and trying to work it out, they're coming to Washington and please, Kamala Harris, fix it for us. Like, Wait, you mean you can leave it. work if you're losing? <laughs> you can just leave? Now I, you can never leave. You're winning. <laughs> <laughs> never thought. If we can do this, just imagine what you can do. Instead of celebrating billionaire Richard Branson, his Virgin Galactic crew ushering in an era of space tourism, liberals are throwing shade at the historic space flight. Watch. Is it moral? Is it ethical to be launching rockets and flying off to space and spending all this money and burning all this fuel in an age of climate crisis? What an ass. He's not the only one, and Socialist Senator Bernie Sanders is trashing the focus on space. Quote. Here on Earth, in the richest country on the planet, half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. People are struggling to feed themselves, struggling to see a doctor. But, hey, the richest guys in the world are off in outer space. Yes, it's time to attack the billionaires. <laughs> um, where is he going wrong with this, Jesse? Progressives used to be about progress. Like, what is Bernie Sanders? What would he tell Magellan? Mm. Let's focus less on sailing. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, oh, um... <laughs> Ford, you know what? Forget about the car. Poor people need better bikes. 
What is this guy thinking? And then you look at history. The history of, of the civilization are about pioneers mm -hmm. and entrepreneurs and innovators kind of pushing the envelope that then reaps the benefits for the masses. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to colonize the solar system eventually. <laughs> that, that's going to make us the illegal aliens. Then maybe the Democrats would like us. I don't think Stelter believes what he says. Yeah. I get a real phony vibe from that guy. And they used to tell us about what was immoral to do in the bedroom. Remember, you know, don't tell us what to do in the bedroom. Now he's telling us what to do in our own spaceship. <laughs> it's my spaceship. I do whatever I want in that spaceship. Whatever I want. So, Jesse, you're the resident <laughs> Democrat explainer in chief on the show. So what is their angle on this? I don't think there is an angle. I think people oh. wanted to fill up airtime, and it was an interesting story, and it was televised, and for people who weren't watching Wimbledon or then watching the football. But Bernie? Bernie's score? Bernie is, and I was an ardent Hillary Clinton supporter, but one thing I could agree with Bernie stands about, he's just Bernie. He's consistent. <laughs> he has been yeah. curmudgeonly like that for 50 years. However. However, what? However, <laughs> do you remember when he was against millionaires and billionaires? And then he was a millionaire. And then he became a millionaire. And he was like, uh -huh. and I was like okay, just tax the billionaires. Yeah. I mean, if Bernie does all, I mean, yeah. if he continues to play his cards right, but, he can But on a serious a note, Dan, I know we make fun of it, but I'm a firm believer that space is our new defense. We've got to be competitive in space. And it is very clear that the Russians are turning the Cold War online. So shouldn't we be... Yeah, we have to explore and expand, this, yeah. and that's what humans do, and, and we do it best here. I think that Bezos will uh, try to take on Branson, but it's, that kind of competition, I think, is very healthy. Uh, it's also, like, I'm obsessed with what's happening in the Arctic, um, where uh, the United States and China and Russia, everybody is competing for a piece of that. If I've left out your country, please forgive me. <laughs> Don't have me. Greg. This, uh, uh, Brian Stelter should embrace space because at his rate of expansion, Greg, he's going to need a bigger plan. Oh, Greg. Look, uh, do it. To Brant Branson and Bernie, they're, they're of a type. Branson's yeah. the billionaire. He's supposed to do this. Bernie's the socialist. He's supposed yeah. to do that. But I go back to what I said in the A block is that the media is a perfect example. That piece is that we are too busy looking into our past instead of looking towards the future. History is happening now. History is happening now or in the future. Future Greg? Forget the, yeah, future Greg. <laughs> but this stuff, like, but we're too busy trying to figure out what statue to knock down, right? right? We gotta knock down a statue because yeah. our past out. Meanwhile, do you think Russia or China or those other countries you mentioned are sitting around thinking of what statue to knock down? No, they're, 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 they're trying to do the same thing. They're knocking down us. The person who, gets, who, who is able to get into space and figure out a way to, let's say, create a Star Wars type thing, they run everything. Do so you mind, it has to be us. Do you mind endorsing, because I know it costs a lot of money, and, and you make the most of all, all of us. Will you pay for my ticket? <laughs> yes, I'll pay for your ticket, right, and I, I don't know if Would that's you true. go? I would go. I would go. And I'm afraid of heights, but I want to see space. I'm afraid of In the Heights, <laughs> the movie. I never saw no, it. Was, it was actually a good movie. All right, the fastest it was a great